welcome. And in the chat, we're putting in, how did you know? So right in the chat, when you first knew who you were. So when did you know if you were different or if you were same as everybody else around you? Or did you know at some point if you were gender non-conforming, if you were cisgender, if you were transgender? That's what we're having you put in there. And we will begin. So our presentation norms. So a disclaimer, some of these topics will be triggering and we will use terminology that is specific, medical, frank, and accurate. So we will be using medical terminology throughout this. So if you are somebody who might be in a public area, we would advise using headphones because not everybody might be comfortable with hearing this, and that's okay. If you have any questions, please use the chat to ask questions. You don't need to raise your hand. And you can direct your questions to Verona Holder. If you have an anonymous or a private question you would like to ask to one of our one of the presenters today. So if you don't want your name to be put out there, you can always chat it to Verona and Verona will ask one of us be open during this conversation. Be curious, not judgmental. You, you're already here. You already have an open mind. So thank you for that. Please monitor your microphone and stay muted. There are a lot of us in here today and we wanna make sure that everybody is able to speak when they need to. This will be graphic heavy. So consider turning your camera off. There will be a lot of graphics that pop up through this. So to help your bandwidth, just make sure your camera is off. And then this session will be recorded. We will share the presentation. Participants' names will not be verbalized. And disrespect will not be tolerated. So please, no trolling. And if you need to, you can activate Zoom captions by selecting the live transcript in your menu bar. So if you need to have uh, captions, please, you know, open up your menu bar. We have that on the screen for you. All right. Our land acknowledgement will be read by Kit. Aloha. Our land acknowledgement, we offer up this land acknowledgement of Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people are Kanaka Maoli. The aina from which we join you stretches from the mountaintops of Pu'uvai Mani'ihau to the shores of Puna on Hawaii Island. We also acknowledge the various indigenous lands from which each of you joins us and the original people of those lands. Together, today, we gather wisdom and inspiration from our kupuna to our cake. We honor and acknowledge the sacrifices made by those on this journey of exploration. Mahalo. Wow. So in this session, first, we're going to just go over a quick bit of HST and HCR. We're going to give you some solid information about the past all the way up to now. We're going to tell you about the HIDO policies and guidelines so that you can help your students the future of LGBTQIA, and then we are going to introduce some very special guests who have offered their knowledge to us today. So who we are and why we're here. So the HSTA Human and Civil Rights Committee, we are here to promote human and civil rights to support and nurture diversity in our multifaceted community. And the CARES Committee is for culture, advocacy, respect, equity and support. And it is an initiative from HSTA HCR to integrate social and racial justice principles into education to create schools and communities that are safe, inclusive and equitable for all Keiki. And our presenters today. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Verona Holder. And as was previously stated, um, I want to let you know that if you have any questions during this whole presentation, 
that I would like for you to chat to me directly and I will make sure that your answers, your questions are asked over the whole presentation or I will make sure I get an answer for you. Um, your name will not be stated at all. I will not type your name in. I will not say your name as I ask the question. So please feel free to direct them directly to me. And I've been teaching for 17 years. I've been on the island of Oahu for the past six years teaching at the same school. And I'm here to learn and to listen and to just be involved in this community. So I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for being here. And I'm gonna pass it on to Kit. Aloha, my name is Kit Brisuela. I teach at Kahuku High and Intermediate School. I um, have been teaching, this is my 22nd year there, and I am a member of the Human and Civil Rights Committee, learning every day more and more from my committee members and from everyone. Mahalo, and I'll toss it to Kaleo. Hello, my kako, my name is Kaleo. I am in my 25th year of teaching, and I am currently at Halau Kumana Public Charter School. And I welcome everybody today, and I'm going to toss it over to Daphna. Hello again. I am Daphna Ehrenhalt. I am here to help. I'm in my 15th year as a teacher, my sixth year in Hawaii, and my third year at Ka'au Elementary School. Occasionally on our screen, or on your screen, you will see a gray box that pops up and that will disappear as quickly as I can make it. Just as a heads up for all of you. Um, thank you so much for being here today. It is really important that you're here to help as many of our students as possible. So a little bit of background information. So LGBTQIA, it is a mouthful of a, of a name really. So this is what it stands for. We have lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, intersex, and asexual. And you don't need to worry about writing all of this down because at the end of this presentation, we will have this slideshow available for you. So you don't have to worry about taking notes. You can just simply absorb all of this information now. But this is the basics of that whole, I don't know if it's an acronym or not, but that's what it stands for, if you didn't know. Sometimes these terms will vary. So on the left-hand side, you have the LGBTQ and there are a couple of extra Qs in there. So we have Q for queer, which is an umbrella term and it's a term that's being reclaimed. It's also an identification. So I oftentimes consider myself to be queer when I don't want to explain to people that I am non-binary, gender fluid, demi panromantic that's a bit of a mouthful. So sometimes I'll just say, I'm queer and I'm okay with that. But Q also stands for questioning. I is for intersex, which is born with sex variations of chromosomes. This was um, archaically known as hermaphrodite. We have phased out that word. Um, we often add a two at the end of this for two spirit, which is an indigenous third gender. On the right hand side, we have a little bit more of the in-depth of the prefixes, suffixes, and root words. So we have spent so many years teaching our students all of these Greek and Latin roots, and now they are using it. A lot of these terms came about in the past 20 years. So demi is you develop an emotional attraction first. We have um, like polysexual and polyamory. So it means many. You have gender fluid, which flows between masculine and feminine. You have non-binary, which doesn't identify with a gender and that falls under the trans umbrella for some, not all. You have gray, which is an infrequent attraction. You have cisgender, which follows the gender assigned at birth, agender, where you have no specific gender. And then what we're talking about today so the last four on the right side, you have FTM, which is female to male, MTF, which is male to, or male to female, AFAB, which is assigned female at birth, and AMAB, which is assigned male at birth. So all of these terms 
for many of us, they're new. Um, and you don't need to know the exact definition because the person using this term to describe themselves, they understand the nuance and all you have to do is respect who they are. Now passing it off to Kaleo. Okay. Um, here are some other cultural terms. A lot of indigenous cultures, they do have a, uh, a third, like a middle gender or a middle identifier. And here's just some of them. They're way more than this. And if you're interested in knowing all the other terms, I do have a list of um, that I had put together. But for Filipino, you have Bakla, Samoa, uh, you have Fa'afafine, uh, Tonga. Bakaleiti, but now they're using leiti more, as in lady, uh, leiti, and then nadle is Navajo, mahuti is Tahiti. Ma Tahiti is also another <clears throat> place that also uses mahu. They're the only other um, island people that you also use mahu. Uh, Katoi from Thailand and the Hydras from um, India, and then and so forth. There's many, 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 many more. Um, here we have mahu and transgender, and um, there's a bit of a difference, but there's some commonality between the two. Um, mahu in our traditional Hawaiian culture uh, were people who were uh, ranked above a kahuna and below an ali'i. There was this, this middle area, and below the kahuna you have the maka'inana. And so the people who were identified as mahu, they were spiritual people, meaning because they were in between. So they could go into spaces that were predominant for males or females, but they could enter in these spaces and they can do um, certain practices. Uh, they were very good on creativity, um, like logistics, like things like that. And they were called for these special services when stones needed to be placed, uh, when certain ceremonies need to happen. They were also the people who, who were um, mostly able to touch the ali'i. So they would do their hair, they would dress them, they would do a, the adornments on them. A lot of the mahu had um, long hair, like longer hair, and it was like an ehu color, so like an orangish gold color um, on their hair. And then they would be adorned with um, uh, variations of like flora and um, their outfits were a little bit different. And um, they were also people who were selected, especially during the missionary time to hold information or hold cultural information. And they would hold that because they had to go underground. When the missionaries came, the missionaries were saying, no, this can't be happening. So the mahu as well, um, they were holding on to certain culture practices, for example, like the hula um, movements and chants that were specific to hula. They were told them and taught them, and then they went underground and to preserve them. In transgender, transient gender, transgender, like so in transgender, it's like a, it's become an umbrella term. Um, initially, it was people who um, changed their gender, yeah, like um, over time. And uh, we do have animals that are transgender. However, we've come we've come a long way, and now we know that um, people just that's just the way that their body works is that that's their body makeup. And I can go into details at another time, but uh, for transgender, it's a little bit different because it's more of a Western term. Um, mahu is more of like a sacred term that's specific to um, our indigenous culture in Hawaii. So there's a little bit of a difference. There are mahu who identify as well as transgender and may use the words, um, the identifiers um, back and forth and vice versa. But um, if you really, really, if you're very interested in knowing more about Mahu, like specifically and the spiritual presence, um, we're gonna show you a little video later, but um, there is 
a significant kind of like a significant difference that we've kind of lost over time um as history progressed we kind of lost that term if you were to open our puke vehe vehe um, that's our Hawaiian dictionary. And you look up the word mahu, it's going to include um, sexuality terms. Like it's going to say uh, a, um, like a homosexual, it's going to say, or gay or lesbian, you know, uh, it's going to say those terms. But because when Mary Kavena Pukui wrote our dictionary, she was already Christianized. And so in order to like actually have our word inside the dictionary um it did it was encompassing for that purpose um all these things however like i said the the true meaning or the true definition of mahu it got lost back then um after the missionaries came so um although people who are gay and lesbian may say that they're mahu um, that's according to that dictionary and not necessarily according to um, historical, you know, when you when you look at look at history. OK, so. Hi, Kaleo, before you move on, um, I have a question here. Is there a AFAB equivalent to Mahu or does it apply to both AFAB and AMAB? Where um I'm not understand no I'm not understanding the acronym so so A F A B is assigned female at birth oh, and A M A B so in okay. this next slide does help with that okay so um yeah I got it cool a lot of terms out today everybody okay um mahu uh we have and mahu kane so if you grew up in Hawaii, and maybe if you didn't, but you're aware of it, in Hawaii, mahu became a derogatory term. So it was a teasing thing. So if a boy was, uh, you know, a boy was acting more feminine, they're like, hey, you mahu, okay? And it became a word that was used to tease others. And so when somebody was or identified as mahu it was very um it was you know it was very hard it was very difficult and so in about the 1980s 1990s um late 80s i would say early 1990s um kulia namamo started up and they decided on these terms mahukane and mahuahine to reclaim and re-enter mahu into our, um, you know, to empower it, empower these terms. And so they started off with mahu wahine, mahu kane, to really uh, give back that power, kind of similar to um, when Daphna was talking about the word queer. Uh, mahu is a cultural term. Again, it is also used in Tahiti. Uh, Tahiti also has two other terms, two or three other terms. One of the other terms is a derogatory term. So make sure when you're going to like try to identify somebody from a different country that you look up the term, because sometimes there's terms that is actually there as a derogatory term. Like that is, you know, and then they say the term. So you don't want to use that to refer to somebody who is identifying in the middle or, um, transient gender yeah so uh you have it transgender people used to hate being called mahu uh, they reclaim the word we have the word when somebody is assigned at birth for example if we go back to hawaiian history um lots of times some families had like say five boys five penis people right boys and um the last one that was born would assume the roles of a female. So in other words, they would be treated as a female. So they would be Mahu, the last child. So this child does not personally maybe identify as Mahu, but that child would live Mahu as Mahu because the roles and responsibilities of a female child will fall onto that last child and vice versa. So if you have many daughters, 
the last child will assume the roles and responsibility of, of being mahu and carry out male, um, the roles that a young male child would do. So yeah, you could be assigned a certain way at birth and in our traditional culture would have to assume the roles and responsibilities of somebody who, um, who, it, who is uh, very different, you know, born very different than how you were born, yeah. So another thing too I learned is that um, in that case, they would also wear the attire. So the male would have pa'u, skirt, female would be, wear um, hume malo or wear a malo, yeah, in that case. And they were identified as that, um, as that gender in their life. Um, there were also times where, I, I don't, I think this is maybe like a transgender 102, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't want to get too much into that. If somebody wants to learn more, we can totally like talk story about it. And um, I could maybe do a transgender 102, 201, 101A, whatever, okay. <laughs> All right, so we have a short video to show you that will help explain a little bit more of this. Uh, you will see the little gray bar for a moment, but it'll be okay. Te ao mā mō tō kāko hi hewa noho ali i a o a. Aia nō he e hā mō kanaka tūpai a naha o ta holo moana. A haele mai lako mai moa ula nui a kea, a tū mai hawa i nei. A oia mau malihini, heu i kanaka leo maliu. A he no no he wai pahe no nae. A ole he tāne, a ole he wahine. He mau mahu lāko. He pālua noho i lāko maka na au, me ka noo noo a mana ano apau. A o te ino tā lāko wala kai, o i ano o ka pai mahu. He mau hiwa hiwa anā atua, o ia mau tahuna lapa au. O ka puni mana nui. Kinohi, waha nana i te pāpā lua. O ka hāloa me tāna lā ahu tāhea. A o ka pai mahu o ka tau lā ahu. Waka ana mai no lākou i to lākou ite me to lākou na awao 
ina kana koia pai aina A ah, lava pono talako hana, hu ka i ini e mahalo i a po e tahuna la pa'au, me ka tutulu aku i kikahi mea ho'omana o ya lakou. Te po tāne lakou i nau e ai, wa ātoa toa lakou makai muki, he wahi taulana i te po hatukani. Nau e aku me e hā mau po atu nu nui, a hiti loa e wai ki ki. A ulu mai kala, wai hua kula lākou i tā lākou mana la pa'au, me takanu puke tai, i mau ti i ho'o mana, mā lalo o tupo hatu tai tai. Ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-ma-
Um, later on, we are gonna have Joe Wilson. Uh, he's the he is one of two creators. His partner Dean Hammer um, w- created Kapai Mahu for all of us, you know, and Kumuhina and all that. And Joe is here today, and he's gonna talk later when we um, spotlight our guests. And I would also like to bring in Mama Maddie Sissy Pasara right over there. I see her in the chat. I want her to talk later too. So if we can spotlight her later on. Sorry, Mama, you're here. <laughs> okay, so we got some. Wow, I feel all nervous now. Nah. <laughs> okay, sexuality and gender identity. Um, huge difference, often confused. Okay, so sexuality, sexuality is basically how who you wanna who you wanna be with, like who you wanna love, who you wanna. Um, be romantically involved with um, that is your sexuality and there are hundreds of different sexualities out there Uh, you heard about some of them at the beginning of this presentation Um, there are like sexuality relationships that um, actually don't even involve sex Um, it's purely emotional relationships you have ones that involve sex and then you have ones that involve um male and male male and some male i don't know what it is you know like if there's a gay man and then you have another man and the other man of thinks that the gay man likes him you know i don't know any of you who are cisgen i mean who are heterosexual love every single man or love every single woman out there you know you go to the mall and you're like oh i love them i love them i love them 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 but for some reason when we go into like lesbian and gay relationships um it sends that vibe i guess and so really um sexuality is about who you who you want to be involved with okay romantically and now gender identity on the other hand is how you um see yourself how how you are on the inside okay um your gender identity so start thinking about your sexuality and think about your gender identity and going back to that question how did you know who you are like who told you that uh how did you know that you were that religion how did you know that you were a boy or you were a girl or you were trans like how like what happened you know did you just wake up one day and be like wow i'm female wow i'm male wow i'm trans like what happened at what age did you first discover that and so your gender identity um lots of times initially it is um when you are a very small child and say you are female at birth okay and you are a very small child and your parents put you on a um in a dress and they're like, oh, you're such a pretty girl. Look at that dress. Look at those curls. Girls wear ribbons, you know, and girls play with dolls. And then you're like, mm, I guess I'm a girl, you know? Um, if you are a boy, boys do this, boys do that, you know? And then you discover, oh, I'm a boy, you know? Because you really don't know that there's a difference in genitalia. Like you just are who you are. And, um, and sometimes, um, and that's our first, that's our first, like you're fed this information. When you go to the toy store, you go to Toys R Us that no longer exists in Hawaii, but you go to Toys R Us and then on one side of the Toys R Us are like the pastel colors, all the of domestic duty things, right? Vacuum cleaner, dolls, carriages, strollers, things like that, right? On one side. And then you look on the other side and you see all these bold colors of dark, black, um, blue, all that stuff, fighting things, trucks, right? And then you go, say you're a boy, right? You go into a toy store and you start venturing over to the pastel colors because pastel colors are cool. And you think that that is so cool. I want that dolly right there. And then your parents come and grab you. No, you got to go to the boy side and they start moving you over to the other side and vice versa. Yeah, you got to go on this side, right? Because 
the, this is the binary system that our parents grew up in. A binary means like boy, girl, girl, boy, okay? And nothing in between. And that is how we grew up. And, um, and because people told us that's what it is. And then, so that's what we believe, right? Why should I not believe my parents that I am a boy or a girl, right? Then later on, you have a child, a young child, even younger now, three, four years old are saying, I'm a boy. No, you, you're a girl. You have this. You have these parts so that you're a girl. And then, no, 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 I'm a boy, you know? And then it adds to confusion. And for parents, it's usually at that point is when the child starts to do things that are hurtful to themselves. When you have your three-year-old child saying that they want to hurt themselves, not exist, kill themselves even, you know, how do I cut it off, mommy, when they're in the shower? That's, that's scary for a parent. You know, that's very scary for many reasons. That's scary for a parent, but that's also another thing is that it's scary for them. It's confusing for them. It's a time of grief for them because when you have your baby and all you parents can can uh, probably identify with this is that you have all these hopes and dreams and you plan and you buy all the blue clothes or the, the pink clothes or whatever. And you had that, what is that? Um, gender reveal party when you pop the, the balloon and all the pink dust flies out of it, right? Because you had an idea of what kind of child you're gonna have. But this now it's different. It's different because now they're saying that they want to hurt themselves. They want to cut things off their body. And what are you going to do? Put the child back in your stomach and be like, okay, change the other way, you know? Um, so that's the whole thing about assigned gender, gender expression, gender identity, and gender role, okay? So we have to really, really break out of these systems. And later on, Daphna is going to share um, a little bit more about that and how we can support our students in our statistics and data, okay? All right, so one way you can look at gender and approach gender with a younger child or with your students is by using something called the gender unicorn. And this was put out by transstudents.org and you have gender identity, which is what is inside of your head. So gender identity is, are you male, female, or something else? And so that is how you imagine yourself in your head. You have gender expression, which goes towards how you look on the outside. And so are you dressing in traditionally feminine or masculine clothing, or are you using something else? Are you male and painting your fingernails? Are you female with a very, very short haircut? So things like that can attribute to gender expression. You have sex assigned at birth. So that's female, male, or you can have other, which would be intersex, which is where the gender markers are not necessarily outright there. Then you have what is in your heart. So who you are physically attracted to and who you are emotionally attracted to. So this can be used with students to help them kind of put where they are. They can put a little mark on the arrows to go, am I more this way or more that way? Let's see here. And then we have a, a quick of, let's break the gender norm stereotype. So I don't know if Kaleo is frozen or not. Oh. Okay, sorry, I was checking the chat. Got a lot of good stuff going on in there. Okay, so these are people um, you may or may not know from our society here, right in uh, the United States. Um, here, I just wanna point her out. This is Janet Mock. And Janet Mock grew up in Hawaii. She, um, you know, she grew up in Kalihi and she went to um, Moanalua and Farrington. 
um, Wanalo for middle school and then Farrington later on. Um, remarkable woman came out in a very huge, I believe it was a Mary Claire magazine. She was a, a writer and came out to the world in an all exclusive, um, you know, a, a store, her story. And then she wrote two books um, following that about her life. And if you really want to know what it was like growing up, Mahu, although everybody's um, narratives are very different, but this gives some perspective um, if you were to grab her books and, and read them. Uh, this here is Jazz Jennings and Jazz, little cutie. She um, started her transition when she was, well, she was three or four, but not publicly until a little bit later when, um, when she got a lot of public attention, uh, you know, and the mom and and Jazz and her family um, came on TV and they were on their, I guess, you know, they really shared their story, their family story in, in, in first an initial like documentary and then in a series uh, like in reality. And she transitioned pretty much in front of everybody else um, in the world. And Jazz wrote some children's books uh, for people to help. Uh, help people understand um, transgender folks and for young transgender um, children. Also, she wrote her own book. And then um, Jazz went to kindergarten as how she presents. Uh, she started kindergarten and went through her school years. Um, that's a huge thing for somebody who's transgender is to be able to have those throwback Thursday pictures of themselves in high school and elementary as how, how they are. As who they are, okay. Um, up here is Skyler, and uh, oh, down here, Skyler. Uh, Skyler is the first Division One athlete to compete as trans, um, or to be openly trans and compete in Division One athletics. We all know that athletics has come up many times on whether or not um, transgender students should be allowed to participate in athletics that align with their um, their gender identity or their identity. Um, Skyler participates for Harvard University. Uh, this is Elliot Fletcher, actor. You probably saw him in some movies. Uh, also trans, uh, uh, op openly transgender person who has been acting and in the spotlight. Uh, we don't have many transgender actors, but we have many up and coming and you're gonna see a lot more programming that have trans actors. And here's Chella Man, also an actor, very um, significant intercept for him. <clears throat> He's also deaf, so he signs. And his actors, his roles are usually deaf characters. And then here's some other well-known people. Most recent, Elliot Page, um, uh, came out to the world as being transgender. You remember, I think the most recent movie that they were in was Umbrella Academy. And so they finished filming Elliot as um, how they identified before. And then um, Elliot will now moving forward be Elliot. So um, here you can also see some a non-binary person or somebody who's non-binary and that is you you have more and more students in your rooms that are going to identify as non-binary yeah so they don't um they don't conform to any of that binary system male or female they're both or none you know so um here's somebody an example of being non-binary yep all right so this is a part for transgenderism. And this would be Kaleo. Hi. You tired of me yet? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Okay. Transgenderism. Uh, the word transgender was coined by Harry Benjamin. He's a German endocrinologist. Um, he coined the term around the 1960s, although transgender people existed way before then, but um, he was the one who was like, hmm, people are changing gender, you know, and um, he thought it was really interesting being an endocrinologist, right? Endocrinologists, they, um, 
you know, they work with hormones and they, he was wondering why this was happening and why this phenomenon is happening. And if you're really interested, we can go way in depth of when this happens um, later on. But transgenderism is in every culture, every group of people. It's in animals. Animals are transgender. The uhu or parrot fish, clown fish, sharks and penguins and earthworms and the maned lioness. Um, there are, you know, things that happen in our whole animal kingdom that um, that point at transgenderism intersex, and because ideally it is the survival of the species, yeah. Like so, there's a need for transgender people or transgenderism everywhere because it ensures the survival of species of people. Um, in Native American, we have like two spirits, right? Two spirits. And then you think about two spirits, you have people who are right in the middle. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier, Polynesian cultures, you know, we have people who are in the middle. And there's many legends of pre-contact Hawaii dual genderism and bisexuality were accepted. Um, there was a man, Paul Gogan, um, and he was an artist and he went to Tahiti, came to Hawaii, came off the ship looking flamboyant, you know, and with his nice hair and nice outfits, you know, of those kind of travelers that came across from Europe, right? They came off and they're like, oh, transgender person. So what he did was they took him to go in the transgender area of the village. So he lived with people who are Mahu for years, seven to nine years. And he wrote journals and journals of about what he saw. And he drew pictures. And in the pictures, there were transgender people. And that's how we know what they were wearing, how they were dressed. Um, he had a lot of photos of that. And you can go and look him up in history for that um many many other um other instances i do even have like some stories of transgenderism in our in our history some actual stories not the full story so i would have to do more research for that but there is stories of and mo'olelo mo yeah our legends and stories so the process of transitioning is um like, like it is, it's, it's a process, yeah? And so you have, although there is no singular um, path to person who's transitioning, um, generally a person would see a mental health professional, have a real life experience, go through hormone therapy or hormone blockers in the case of your students. If they choose, they may have a surgeries, they may or may not have surgeries. Um, it doesn't make you any less transgender if you have the surgeries or hormones or not, you know, um, and then changing your legal documentation. So it is a process and it takes a long, long time to happen. So you have a mental health professional um, in Hawaii. You need a medical doctor, although you can um, to start your real life experience, you can have any kind of um, you can have, you know, a, a psychologist that is not a medical, necessarily a medical doctor, but you can have anybody with a master's or higher degree counselor to start your real life experience. The real life experience is when you live for one whole year um, as um, the identity that you're moving towards, you know, that's different from how you may have grown up. Uh, Real life experience, it depends on the person. So some people, uh, when they go to their sessions, they may skip the real life experience because they've already been having a real life experience. So there's no um, reason why they should have another real life experience, right? So, um, and that's just to transition some people who are not comfortable and to just see how they are. And then they process that experience with their medical professional, whoever it is they're working with, yeah? Um, then you have hormone therapy and hormone blockers. Now these are, um, 
by choice, yeah. Hormone therapy and hormone blockers, it depends. Some people don't want to do hormones and some people may choose to. Uh, hormone therapy can kind um, it will be very difficult because in order to start hormone blockers or in hormone therapy for a really young person, sometimes you need um, both parent signatures and not both parents are on the same page. And that makes it really, really hard if you have one parent who is very much against it because that causes so much turmoil for the student because they feel like it's never going to happen. You ever had that toddler where you tell them you're going to get something later and then later is like right now? So um, for children, there, it's the same thing. It's like when you tell them later to them, there's, they don't know what later is, you know, and they need it right now. And so having to explain that to them, because it's going to take time to acquire the other person's signature. Um, it's, it's going to be a very, very difficult time because the child may feel rejected. They may have a lot of feelings, anger, hurt, and they're going to step into your classroom. And then you tell them to empty the pencil sharpener. And they're like, somebody already did it, you know, and they start yelling at you, right, and it's like, oh, no, like, you have to figure out why is the child being, you know, being that way, and it could be something that may pertain to this if that child ha happens to identify as transgender. Blockers are very expensive. In 2016, we passed a law that allows blockers to be covered by insurance. Previous to that, it was $21,000 for blockers at most for many families, so there was a, a lot Hormone therapy will also um, give you like secondary characteristics. So you may see changes that are aligned to whatever way they're transitioning. So gender dysphoria looks like many things. Some things gender dysphoria can be visual where you can actually see with your eyes. And some things with gender dysphoria is inside where you cannot see it. Um, these are three things, depression, anxiety, and suicide ideation. There's more to go with gender dysphoria than just these three. Depression doesn't necessarily result in suicide or suicide ideation. People can be depressed without that aspect of it. However, depression can contribute to suicide ideation. Um, anxiety, depression can lead to anxiety. Anxiety plays a big part in uh, when a student walks into a room, is everybody looking at me? Why is why are they doing this or why are they doing that? Maybe using the restroom uh, could be an anxious situation for them. Uh, many of us, we just go into the restroom and we don't even think about um, anything else, you know. But children who have gender dysphoria or transgender children are very hyper vigilant. They are watching everybody's response to them. Um, if uh, somebody who is a female to male and have already started breast development, um, they will bind down their breasts. And sometimes they bind down their breasts in ways that are not healthy. Ace bandage is the most common way youth bind their breasts. It is not healthy because it cuts off circulation and it's painful, but they'll do it anyways. Tucking a penis, they will do that. And sometimes they'll use duct tape or things that uh, will hurt them, rip their skin. And um, they will do that, you know, to identify or to be passable um, to their peers and other adults. So just be mindful of what a student is going through when they're going through gender dysphoria. Yes. Um, so a quick note that I put into the chat was that there are companies that do send out binders for folks who want to bind. And this little meme I thought was extremely helpful. You can help make a trans kid happy and healthy, or you can make them feel isolated and miserable, but you cannot make a trans kid cis. So transgender is where you are a different gender from what you were assigned at birth. Cisgender is you are what you were assigned at birth is what you're going with now. Um, and there were some questions in the chat to Verona about pronouns and using the word transgender or transgenders. So I will address those in the next, in the section after this, but we're going to get into some statistics right now. The Williams Institute in 2016 
sort of took a, well, they took a survey of how many people were trans in the state. And for Hawaii, we ranked number one. So we, it, five years ago, we were ranked number one. We have almost 1% of our population as trans. And that was for just adults. We're going to get into the section for minorities and for transgender youth. So from the Hawaii Sexual and Gender Minority Health Report in 2018, which Kaleo helped, of course, because Kaleo has all the knowledge. Um, so thank you, Kaleo, for this. Uh, we have a focus on transgender youth. So the all of the information from this study comes from these students here. So just under 40,000 students in high school, in public school in Hawaii took this survey. So grades nine through 12 in four counties. And from this data, we were able to gather a lot of information and about 3% of those students were trans. So we have at least 1,260 high school youth who identify as transgender. And that is a really important number because we have 257 public schools. So there's about four trans high school kids or well, nope, those numbers don't work, but we have plenty of trans kids in high school right now, which means we also have them in middle school and in elementary school. Half of our transgender youth normally don't sleep at their parents' house compared to 94% of cisgender youth. So you're gonna see the statistics about homelessness with transgender kids. Of the 57% of transgender youth, they identify as LGB, but 16% of our LGBT or our LGBTQ group only identify as trans. As far as health goes, trans youth are three times more likely to go hungry because there isn't enough food at their home compared to cis youth. Less than half have seen a doctor, just a little over half have seen a dentist in the past year. Um, that's a lot. Three in five miss school because they're sick. A lot of them are misusing drugs. So half of them, about half of them drink, they use vaping products. Two in five are currently using marijuana. Nearly half of them are misusing prescription pain meds. One in four of them are injecting illegal drugs. So when you think about that number of 1200 students that one in four of them is injecting illegal drugs, that's a terrifying number. And another terrifying number is that one in four of them have experienced sexual violence, have been forced to have sexual intercourse or have skipped school because they felt unsafe. So this is really important that you understand that your students who are trans, there is a good likelihood that they have been sexually assaulted at some point. And as educators, when we talk about gender dysphoria, when we talk about um, students who feel unsafe and act out, this could be the cause behind it. And as educators, we might never know this. And that leads us to this slide, which is nearly half of our transgender youth felt hopeless in the past year. And half of them have attempted suicide. So when we look at that number of 1,260, to know that 630 of them have attempted to take their own life. That's why we're here right now. We're here because these students need our support more than ever. Trans youth are seven times more likely to commit, to attempt suicide than um, cisgender youth, LGBT, or LGBTQIA plus are four times more likely than heterosexual youth to commit suicide. The reason that we use chosen names, the reason that we use pronouns is because there's a 29% decrease in suicidal ideation 
and a 56% decrease in suicidal behavior. We had a question of why do we need to use these pronouns? This is why, because when you identify yourself, you are showing that you are a safe space and you are a person that a student can trust and that decreases suicidal ideation. Um, we have, I'm, I'm not going to read through all of these, but trans youth are more likely to have unstable housing. They get kicked out. Uh, more than one in two trans youth don't have an adult or a teacher at school that they can talk to. Um, they have to go outside of school and even outside of school, less than half of them have an adult that they can relate to or talk to. Um, this is like, it's hard to talk about. A lot of them, two thirds of them, don't think that they're going to complete anything after high school. So we've put all of this, all of our hopes and dreams into these students of ours and they aren't going to go beyond high school. Some of them don't even think that they're going to finish high school at this point. The dropout rate is enormous. Um, and the, pro the thing is, is that queer youth and heterosexual youth equally feel that they should be completing this, but they aren't. Hey, Daphna, I'm going yes. to interject here because I'm getting some great questions. Of course. And I'm noticing that people who are sending these questions are being very um, conscious of the fact that it may be hurtful or they, they want more information, but I can tell that it's coming from a loving place that they want to know what they can do to best help. And um, it's looking like educators are wondering, you know, how can we help out people who are feeling this way? Do you know if there are any mandates or guidelines that have been put out either by HSTA or DOE um, for public school bathrooms for students yes. that might identify as transgender? So in a little part, a little bit after this, we're going to go through the uh, HIDO policy of what to do if you have a trans student in your class and how to help them live their best life in school. So we will be addressing that as well. It, okay. I, I promise you it's coming up. <laughs> yeah. Please stay for that section. Yes. Please Here's please another stay. one. Um, someone wanted us to touch upon some of the words that might be um, that should be generally avoided. Um, this person has said words like the transgenders or transgenders may not be a way that they would like to be identified as. How can we um, address that? So we can, one of the more accepted terms is just saying trans folks because that helps. And there are a lot of gender neutral ways of talking to a whole classroom of students, which we're also going to come up on. And so currently the vocabulary changes all the time. So some trans folks are fine with saying transgenders, things like that, because that is where they are. Vocabulary changes all the time. And that is something that sometimes we are not fully caught up on and we have to learn to modify our own um our own vocab so that we can better help our students so i'm going to go into some of that in a bit as well can i give one more question yes. and then it looks like kevin has addressed one of the questions that i had about emails and aliases about um, mm -hmm. people who have switched their name and they want their dead name to be gone from oh, their yeah. Hawaii public schools. Do you know about um, the Hawaii DOE mandates on changing it like an infinite campus or will that be addressed later as well? That will also be addressed later with the um, I can address, uh, I just want to comment here for the transgenders. I just put in the chat like, for transgenders, the transgenders, uh, transgendered, um, this is not a state of being, yeah, like, so this is a person's identity, and the transgenders or transgenders, it just sounds exclusive, 
um, when you're talking about somebody who is a part of and working part of society, um, you can say trans folk, trans, um, tra mahu, um, to relate to people who are trans or just simply just ask the person, um, how would you like me to re refer to you? But you can default to try to be more inclusive in the language because it just sounds really out there. And as far, um, Daphna is going to cover it, so I won't talk so much on it, but just um dead dead names uh is used on the internet a lot however it doesn't pertain to everybody so some people refer to their the names that they were born born with um as their dead names the name that they don't use anymore however there are some people who establish a whole identity under their that name their birth name and so they may not refer to their um, previous name as the dead name. So they may still um, use it or still acknowledge that name. So I just want to um, make it clear to you so that when you're talking to students, um, just maybe just ask them. I think the default would be to just ask them. Yeah. yeah. How and can I ask another question about laws in Hawaii? So yeah. schools, can schools let students go to a doctor for hormone treatments during school hours while parents don't know? Apparently this person's friend did this in California and her mom didn't know. And then she changed her mind four years later. Is there a minimum age for transitioning in Hawaii? Yes. Um, there's no minimum age for transitioning. Hormone therapy is something that's usually um, a discussion that happens. Kids do, in Hawaii, kids have responsibility for their own sexual health from the age of 14 on. Kids can um, get married at 16. But for 14 and on, they can have responsibility for their own sexual health. So what that means is they can go into a free clinic and get a gynecological exam. They could get any kind of exams. They can go and get a STI test for a sexually transmitted infection. Um, they can do consult. They can do all that without parent um, parent uh, signing for it. However, hormone therapy would be a little bit different. Um, that process is going to be a process. So a kid can't just walk into a doctor's office and say, oh, I want to go on hormones. However, uh, there are ways that they can access hormones illegally. And if you read Janet Mock's book, she talks about that where her and her friend, uh, Wendy, they both accessed hormones and were using hormones illegally uh, for their transitions. Also, um, young transgender females, that's uh, they were born, born male or assigned male at birth and are transitioning to female, they access uh, prenatal hormones. Prenatal hormones help your, their hair to grow stronger their nails to go stronger and their skin to change from coarse to um to a more finer skin um that females have on their bodies and i think i'm going to put together in a, with my team another workshop to go into detail on some of these um these idea or some of these these terms and ideas these questions are so good. I'm going to ask another one. Um, does DOE have a listing of school GSAs? And we have, I think, um, <laughs> a professional right here with Millie, if she wants to answer that. I bet she knows that. Aloha, friends. Um, that's a great question. Um, we don't have an official listing. And I think um, that's something we'll talk about in this presentation that often um, schools name these clubs different things. So what we've learned is there might be a GSA at a campus, but it might be called the Life Club or the Social Club. Um, and I think that's definitely something that this group with HSTA Cares can think about how we could make a listing for more information. Great question. Yep. All right. And, okay, and I'll address this to the presenters as well, but um, getting documentation on sexual health services available for students 14 plus would be awesome if we could get that together. Yes, we can definitely look into getting that type of information and setting it up. We do have a resource page at um, HSTA, so we can start to gather all of that information to help everybody out. 
All right. Um, we're going to go through, we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can help our students. So this is, this is more of the how to help our students 101 who are trans. So why are pronouns important? Pronouns are really important for our students because if it shows that you support them, it shows that you can be a safe space for them. And so we have the traditional of she and her or he and him. We have the non-binary, which is they and them, and the neo-pronouns. In neo-pronouns, there's a lot for them. So this whole chart, this whole table shows the neo-pronouns are in purple. And this came about mostly through internet culture. So while some of these might go back to maybe a student's own culture, a lot of these came around through websites like Tumblr, where somebody started with the word fey and all of a sudden fey femme fear now is their pronoun set. With pronouns, the first thing is, if you make a mistake, correct yourself, move on, it's okay. I promise you that no student using neo pronouns is going to be upset when you make the correction. They're going to be really happy that you just simply corrected yourself and moved on. If you don't know someone's pronouns, it's okay to ask. It really is. They're not going to be offended by this. Can't say all, but most will not be offended by it because people prefer that you use the correct pronoun and even if it's one that you're not practiced in saying, you can always ask for a little bit of help with this. You can always say, please remind me, or I'm going to do my best at trying to say these appropriately every time. So there are more pronouns, neo pronouns than what's on this page right now, but these are some of the more popular ones that are currently being used. When we talk about gender neutral ways to address your class, my favorite way to address my class is by calling them my favorite humans or my favorite human beings. Sometimes I call them jerks and kids not acting like jerks. I have fun with it because it gives them a little bit of like silliness and you're not just saying boys and girls, you're not separating them out into different groups. You can just tell your kids, all right, I need two lines. You can, you don't have to say, I need the boys to go pick up the chairs. You can say, I need strong students to go pick up the chairs and carry them around. You can take away gender and still address your students. And this one, this has a great list of them. There's a word I do want to point out, which is nibblings which is the gender neutral term for a niece or a nephew. So I have many nibblings and it's awesome. But this quick list, if you're sarcastic in your classroom, goblins and ghoulies, if you want to break the gender norm, thades and gentle femmes. So this is a great way to address your classroom. And this is one way that can be really helpful. However, there is a caveat. If you want to teach pronoun use, it is considered a controversial issue and you will need to get admin approval because parents sometimes don't want their kids to learn about pronouns. Who knew? And you will need to get approval from your admin so that a letter can go out and we will have a letter that you can use. It's a standard form letter that Kaleo made. And with this letter, it allows parents to pull their kid from that class or from that lesson. So this is considered controversial. We don't make these policies, but we enforce them. But the stress is placed on learning how to make judgments based on facts. So if it is a fact that I use the pronouns they, then that is a fact. All right. When we go into bigger policies, so the kit just put down the link for the HIDO policy. This is 
the policy. It came out in 2016 and everybody was supposed to get trained on it. And I, by just the response and the comments of, do we have a policy? It tells me that we, we, we have not been trained on this in five years. So this came out, the first important thing is that the school staff should let the student take the lead in determining and expressing their own gender identity and be mindful of students' right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to their gender, gender identity and expression. So a quick outline of this document. Here, Daphna, before you move on, um, yes. what are your suggestions for when parents or teachers are against all of this for whatever reason and refuse to cooperate with this? Like if they have religious reasons or if they just say, I don't want any of this, what, what are your suggestions for that? They can pull their kid out of the class. Um, I mean, they can pull their kid out of that lesson for it. And at that point, I mean, you might want to address that with admin and see how your admin wants to move on with that. I know personally, I taught a lesson on pronouns. This is why I, I give this caveat of you need to get admin approval. I didn't get admin approval. It was an after school club, didn't think I needed it. And a parent came up and complained and I had to make a formal apology. So if you have parents who don't wanna be involved in it, you may have to handle them slightly differently and avoid the topic at all costs because this is the world we live in, unfortunately. Um, where we, mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't make everybody happy. It's hard, that one's a hard question to answer, but we can still support our LGBTQIA plus youth and we can still use their pronoun in class. That doesn't affect the other student. We can still use their name. Kalea, did you wanna? No, I was just, um, was that about, I, I may have misunderstood the question. Was it about um, if teachers don't wanna do this or parents? It was both, either parents okay. or so, teachers. Um, teachers have to. Yeah, teachers have to. It's part of your professional responsibility. Yeah? So if there is something coming down from the DOE, from the BOE to the DOE, and it's coming to your class that this is how this is a trans safe school policy, then you need to follow that or else you're going to face consequences on an admin level yeah, for not following it. Um, as far as for parents, a uh, couple things is one is the bathroom issue has come a lot up a lot with parents. And um, the other one is um, this one, number six, rights to privacy. So the first one about the bathroom issue, if a parent says, I do not want my child, because previously the transgender student would have to walk across the campus, lose about 10 minutes to go to the health room bathroom, but you all know everybody throws up in that toilet, right? So um it was unsanitary kind of and so now in, in that policy if you were to read it um it says for bathrooms if a parent has an issue with their child using the same restroom as a, ch a transgender child then um that child that parent's child can walk 10 minutes across the campus go to the health room bathroom and use that bathroom that everybody throws up in so yeah. their child so we are giving accommodations but it's for their child yeah um so the transgender child will not lose the 10 minutes and this parent is choosing to have their child use the 10 minutes by not choosing to use the bathroom that everybody else is using. And I really don't know any transgender child or person that walks into a bathroom that aligns with their gender. And if your child is in the stall with somebody else and your child got some other issues that needs to be addressed. So, you know, cause it's all the stalls are pretty private. So, you know, um, if they're in that stall they shouldn't be in that stall with that other person. So, yeah. and then- um, <laughs> That's a different other, issue. Yeah, that's a different issue. And then the other one is the FERPA. That's the, educa the Education Rights Privacy Act. A child can withhold um, this kind of information, sexuality and gender identity. They can, they can, the child can choose to withhold that information from their parents. So if they're seeing a counselor 
uh, there can be a, um, a note on the record saying that this information will not be shared with the with their parents because it could be a very, very dangerous situation if the parents know. They also can come out to their parents with a counselor or with a mediator present so that it can be a safe um, discussion happening for the child. And then sometimes they don't, they're not very good with their words, yeah, children. They just say what's on their mind and so that you can help them with their words and help them tell their parents. Because sometimes there's so much screaming that the parent just, I mean, the child just closes up and just says, never mind already, you know, and you don't, you want to have that discussion because it's going to come up later if the child is sincerely transgender. Yep. And uh, uh, this is a really important one as well. If the teachers are trying to get these clubs put into place, what do you do if admin continues to block the clubs? I have one for that one. So um, Act 110, which was a House bill in 2019, prohibits any discrimination to an educational program that receives state assistance. So if they wanna create a club and there's any other type of club on campus, you can make a GSA. So you absolutely can do this. Um, even if there's pushback from admin, you still can make this club if there's any other type of club on campus. So- You can, mm -hmm. you can also, um have lunch in your room and just so happen some kids stop by you know and you guys have a or you folks have a lunch, nice lunch. session in there now, unofficially yeah you can be a safe a safe space you can create that you don't even need students you can just create the safe space in your room hey if you guys want to stop by or you folks want to stop by come by you know yeah. and sit in your classroom by yourself and just but the the space is open the space yeah. is open so and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can help to create a safer space as well. Um, with this policy, I just wanna highlight on these parts really quick. Never, ever, ever, ever out your student, okay? They, this can put their lives in danger. We know that they can be kicked out of their house. We know that they're already a little bit fragile just from the situation that they're put in. So please do not out your students to their parents or to anybody else. If they come out to you, you can ask them questions of who can I talk to who is safe to talk to. I've seen teachers do this in a Google form of tell me your name and your pronouns and that keeps it private. And can I use this with your parents? Can I use this with other teachers? Can I use this with administration? There, let the student take the lead on how they want to do this. You don't need any medical health or anything to start this process. Every situation is different. It needs to start off with a meeting with the student, the teacher who's trustworthy, the counselor and admin to figure out the supports that are needed. And hopefully your counselor is up for this and are willing to help them do all of these changes. If not, you might be that teacher who is that safe space for that kid. And when we talk about safe spaces, this is one quick way to make your room a safe space. If you go out and you grab a flag that looks like this, this right here is a symbol of being a safe space. Um, they're like a bucket target every, every pride season, so every June. And you can, if you fill out the form at the end of this, our exit survey, you can be one of the five people who get a peace flag or a, you know, HST rainbow shirt or the little safe space badge. There are so many ways to show that you are a safe person for your student. Having these flags up makes a huge world of difference because if your student can recognize that this is a flag for being pan and you just have this somewhere on your desk they're gonna know what this is. Our students are incredibly smart when it comes to this. They see these signs all over. This is how they recognize each other. I just have 12 of them up here. Like I said before, there are over 170 different orientations and identities. So this here, this can go a long way for helping your students, even having something like a little rainbow mug at your desk super helpful. Little props like this can recognize you as a safe space. Putting a rainbow sticker on your ID badge, 
there's your safe space and kids flock to this they understand what it is here's um, how you can be a better ally or do we have a question really quick yeah while you're talking about this and this is a question that i had as well how do you do this for kids who are in an elementary school setting which you are yep. and when admin and teachers and parents are saying that children are too young to be learning about this so i teach 10 year olds i teach fifth grade four of my students have come out to me because i have rainbows up in my room all of my backgrounds and borders are rainbows. It might not be a full flag, but they see the rainbow and they know that I'm safe. They say they see the safe space badge on my ID and they know that I'm a safe person to come out to. And because of those four kids, now I have a whole bunch of other kids on campus who now know me as a safe space teacher. There are a handful of other teachers in my grade level who they're known as safe space teachers as well. And they have something on their badge, they have something in their room, the masks that they wear have rainbow flags on them. There are tons of ways to show it. You don't have to outright be like, I'm gay and have that as part of your, like, you don't have to come out. You can just simply have a rainbow. And when we asked you at the beginning, how old were you when you knew who you were? Many of you put elementary school. These kids know who they are and they just need an adult to talk to. They just need to know that there is an adult out there who is a safe person. And if it's safe for you to be out with your students, now they're seeing a successful queer adult who, who's lived through it. They've made it through to the other side. They've become an adult. They have a job. They're being successful in the world. And now you have become a role model for them. So there's a lot that you can do just as a teacher to help our kids. There's a list of about 18 different things you can do. Um, so to be a better ally, to be a person who can help all of your students, they even have an ally flag, it's black and white, and has a rainbow A in the center. First, you can't tell someone's trans just by looking at them, you're not gonna know. Um, never make an assumption about a transgender, per, uh, their sexual orientation. If you don't know their pronouns, listen first, they will, they'll hint at it. And if they don't hint at it, you can always say, Hey, what are your pronouns? You can ask them quietly. You don't need to ask a transgender person's real name, their birth name, or their dead name. The dead name is the name, the name they no longer choose to go by. It was on their birth certificate. Some people still hold that in their heart because that's who they were. And, but it's not who they are currently. And so let that person decide how they want to be addressed. There's mm -hmm. a big, mm -hmm. And I also wanted to state this, this is another great statement. Um, this person got flack for asking this in another support group, but what about students who have asked if there is a straight pride flag? because they want to include non-LGTQ humans also. Then they can do an ally flag. Um, if there's somebody who wants to be, if they wanna be an ally, then they can do the ally flag, which is the black and white flag with the rainbow A. But normally as far as the straight pride goes, that's kind of a dog whistle of these people are, are looking to be confrontational and they might not be the best people to have around. You can definitely have allies, but you can just simply be an ally. Um, so that's part of it. Um, I hope that helps to answer that question. Uh, so to being a better ally, coming out as LGBTQ is very different than coming out as trans. So people might have multiple coming outs of you can be, you start off as something and you go to the next. Um, be very careful about disclosing confidentiality, use the proper terminology, be patient. Sometimes it takes years for kids to figure this out. Same way it takes years for adults to. Uh, there is no right or wrong way to do this. Never ask anybody about their genitals. It's just weird. Uh, don't, the, be careful of backhanded compliments or helpful tips. So something like that is, oh my gosh, I would have never known you were trans. 
that's not really helpful. Uh, telling somebody that they pass as female or male, that's not really helpful. You can just simply say, you look lovely, you look wonderful, you look handsome. That's a helpful, that's not an insult. Um, when, so as you were talking about the straight pride, you can always challenge anti-trans remarks and you can challenge those things just by saying, why, why would you need? Or why, you can always ask why. And sometimes people will stop when they have to explain themselves because they understand that what they're doing is not being very nice. You can support all gender public restrooms, make your classroom inclusive, set inclusive tones. That's why we're saying, please rename with he, she, they, zir, however you want to use your pronouns, use those because then it allows other people to feel safe. Um, trans folks aren't new. They've, we, we learned, they've been around with everybody and know your limits as an ally, know when to let people speak for themselves.